Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm John Donvan. Uh, this is uh, Karen Zucker, my colleague. And I, uh, up to this point at Kent Presents, have been functioning as a moderator. Today, I'm a little bit uh, in a different role. Um, I'm actually participating more as a speaker. And also, I've learned through long experience working with Karen Zucker that if I tried to moderate her, I would absolutely, that doesn't happen. That doesn't work. Uh, Karen and I um, have published a book. Um, I was told not to be bashful about this. It's called In a Different Key, the Story of Autism. Uh, we were delighted that it was um, named a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2017 as the first time that a book about disability has been so honored, and we were really pleased about that. Um, Karen and I spent seven years uh, piecing together an untold story of autism, its untold history, its backstory that had never been put together before. Um, I want to warn you that when two people have been working together for seven years, that they have a tendency to finish, finish each other. Finish each other's sentences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Except that I didn't finish it very well. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just get a sense of the room. Um, how many people here are have a friend or a family member or someone close to them who has autism. Wow. Wow. It's almost everybody in the room. That's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK. And um, how many people um, have autism? That are Anybody sitting in the audience on the spectrum? No? OK. Um, Very often, pe people identify as being on the spectrum when we speak. Yeah. So I have a personal connection to autism. I have a 24-year-old son with autism, and, uh, and John has a brother-in-law who's um, 50 years old and um, lives in Israel, and, has, um, and his mother-in-law, in fact, created, was a, one, one of the co-founders of the very first autism programs in Israel, because um, there was nothing there at the time. And uh, John and I got started. Um, when I was at ABC News. I was there for about 25 years. I'm a producer. John's still a correspondent there. And uh, when my son got diagnosed, uh, I wanted to not just cover the news anymore, but um, to do something that could help educate the world. And there re really weren't any stories being done about autism. Um, we were the first network team to get started on it. And then about a half a dozen years into that, we decided we needed to do, to do something that would be more everlasting. And Hence the book that took seven years. And the book starts with um, an account of the first child diagnosed with autism. And it was really fascinating for us to learn that there actually was a first child diagnosed. And you know, very often people will talk in terms of epidemiology about patient zero. That was a driving idea behind the, the book uh, about the AIDS epidemic. Who was the first? Where did it start? Autism isn't like that. Autism isn't a disease. It's certainly not infectious. It's more of a, of, a, of a brain condition. It's a type of uh, brain circuitry or v many different kinds of types that are grouped together under autism. But what did happen, and we assume that there were people who would be diagnosed with autism today who lived 300 years ago if the concept was existing, but the concept only came into focus 75 years ago. And it actually came into focus around one child. And we decided to start the story of autism by trying to find out as much as we could about that child. And there were hints left about him in the medical literature. Um, we knew his first name. And we knew his first name because the doctor who diagnosed autism for the first time, who was at Johns Hopkins, uh, named him as, gave his name as Donald. And the, his last name is T, without spelling out what the T stood for and described this child who, uh, who was very, very different, who was brought to his clinic in 1938 as a three-year-old. And over the years, the doctor who wrote about this boy, Donald, for the next 20, 25 years, here and there, made references to him and began to describe him. And through that, initially, we were able, we had quite a few clues, we were able to pin pulled together a sense of who he was and his social milieu. So his, he came from this small town in Mississippi, um, but his parents were not, were, were a little bit uh, outliers socially in Mississippi. Well, they're very wealthy. They own the bank. And when you own the bank um, and you control everybody's mortgages, you, uh, you have a little pull there. So, um, and also they're very well educated. The, the mom was a college graduate, which was, again, we're talking about a small town in Mississippi called Forest. It's in the very center of the state. It was the county seat. But his dad was a graduate, a of, gra graduate of Yale Law School. 
Um, so they were kind of unusual in, in that sense to begin with. Um, despite that, they, they yielded to the pressure of the day to do with their different seeming child that most people did. And when I say different seeming, this boy Donald comes along and he, um, he, he just didn't develop in the way that was expected. He, um, he, uh, his language was very, very peculiar. He did something that was called pronomial reversal, which meant that he switched the word I for you. And he uh, echoed people's speech rather than construct his own speech. Words came out of his mouth, but he was only repeating things that he had heard before, sometimes with enormously D demonstrating enormous mental gifts of memory as well. And you, people in the audience who know autism know that echolalia is something when you repeat something over and over again. So, but he had gifts. He, he uh, memorized songs and he... The, 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 the Christmas carols. One year his mom was playing Christmas carols at the piano. She played them one time and he then went around the house singing them ver verbatim, which he had been singing after hearing them one time. And he had, he, so he could memorize things really well, which probably supported his echolalia, that he could repeat things that he had heard. But his relationship to people was very peculiar and very troubling to his parents. He never, never cried for his mother. And when his dad came home, he never ran to his father. He had no interest in other children. One year, they tried to get his attention. They had a neighbor dress up as Santa Claus and come in and do the whole thing, and he didn't even look up. It's though he couldn't hear what was going on. So they were very, very very worried and they went, made the round of a series of doctors. Uh, again, because they had the money and they had the know-how, they got to some, they got to Mayo, they went to uh, the Campbell Clinic in Tennessee. They sort of got to all of the top doctors, but the advice they got was, and by today's lights, rather depressing. Well, they got the advice that everybody got at that time, which is you put your child in an institution. And um, because Donald's parents were wealthy, they put him in this place called the Preventorium. Um, which was actually a place for children with tuberculosis, or, or almost. It was more children, are, children at risk of yeah. tuberculosis, yeah. Um, but the difference here was most parents who were told to put their children away in the institution did and never saw them again. But um, Donald's parents, after about a year, um, our sense was that they just said, no, we gave up too early. We're going to take him back, and we're going to figure out a life for him. So that, at that point, they went uh, by train, a um, two and a half day journey to Baltimore. And they saw the child psychiatrist at Hopkins named Leo Connor. And Leo Connor met Donald. And Leo Connor puzzled over Donald. And Donald came in uh, at the same time that this Dr. Leo Connor was studying nine or 10 other children. These other children had other diagnoses at the time because there was no diagnosis of autism. They were diagnosed in terms that are now offensive. Uh, they were referred to as morons and idiots and feeble-minded. Some of them were considered, were labeled insane. Uh, in fact, Donald's mother wrote a letter to Leo Connor saying, I'm, my, I'm, my son is hopelessly insane. And he studied Donald for a number of, for two to three years, made repeated visits. And, and he, he said, there's some, it's an, it, insanity is not what's going on here. And it's not a lack of intelligence, because look at how brilliant he is in terms of memory and things like that. There's something different about this, and, it, and it, yet his detachments, apparent detachments socially, his communication language, it's a, it's a different kind of syndrome. And ultimately, he, he wrote an article that he published in 1943 in which he proposed this new diagnosis that we now call autism. He didn't, at that time, he used the word autistic as an adjective to describe it, ultimately it became autism. And Donald was his template. Leo Connor always said afterwards that for him it all began, this whole concept of autism began with Donald. So for us it was, well, let's find out as much as we can about this Donald and, and what happened to him? What was his life like? What happened in his community? And the great thing is that one day you, well. you, you okay. <laughs> Well, both of us were trying to track him down, and we had a few clues. We, figured, we found out the town that he was born, um, which, which was in Forest, Mississippi. And John was doing research on the internet. At that time, he was the only person who used the internet because <laughs> it was brand new. And, um, and I, of course, went through the phone book because there were phone books then. And, um, and one day, um, I started to call, we knew his name was Donald, and we knew T, so I started to call the T's in the phone book. And all of a sudden, an answering machine picks up. 
and it says, the, the, the voice on the other end says, hello, happy spring, and have a wonderful fall, and Merry Christmas, 2007. And I, I hung up and I called John, that's it, we found him. I know this is it. <laughs> so then the next thing was gonna be how we were going But let's to... hold off on that part of it, if you don't mind. <laughs> Just as I got on a roll, you see. <laughs> Well, we, oh, go ahead, go for it, you're right. So we, we always, this is always a work in progress, this thing. Because <laughs> once he starts talking, it's hard to... Yeah, it's right. true. <laughs> um, well... We actually wrote a book together. <laughs> and that's why it took seven years. <laughs> if you had just listened to everything I said, it would have taken two. <laughs> no, it would have taken ten. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, so... <laughs> that is true, probably. <laughs> Um, but we, we want to show you um, some some clips. But oh, I see. You don't want to you don't want to give it away yet. <laughs> we rehearsed this and we rehearsed this and we rehearsed this. <laughs> we're going to show you a video. So what we're doing, the book. It's interesting to us that someone commented when we said how many people here have a connection to autism. Every almost everybody raised their hands and somebody commented. That's why we're here. We actually wanted the book to reach the people who aren't here today. Our goal was to teach in an encouraging and in vivid way the people who don't know about autism that in fact they are connected to autism, that they have a very big role to play in the lives of autistic people by the degree to which they're accepting or non-accepting. We call them civilians. We refer to them as the civilians. And, we, and this, this book is the story, is the history of the people who are represented by those of you in the room. This is their story, they should take pride in it. But we wrote it to reach the civilians. And the book did really well. I mean, it was a New York Times bestseller and, uh, and the Pulitzer thing, but that says to us that there are a lot of people out there who have this connection to autism to, to get that many, that, to do that well in sales. But we knew from the talks we were giving and the book tours that every time we went, there were almost no civilians. So we decided to turn this book into a documentary because we figure if we, you know, it's a big book, uh, a 90 minute documentary is a smaller commitment and we can reach more people. So that's what, why we're now in the process of turning it into a film. And we wanted to share with you some, uh, some scenes from the film. Uh, it'll be a four minute long clip. And it's not, what you're seeing is not an excerpt from the film. The film is not done. This was just from a sort of preview we put together to, to explain it to some of the people that we were pitching it to. But we wanna, we wanna um, show you Donald. And uh, so, this is going to, the film will show, show, have a little bit of the story you've already heard, who he was as a child, but we want to give you a glimpse of who this guy turned out to be. So we can roll that clip now. We found the first person ever who actually discovered it or named it, Dr. Lee O'Connor. And he wrote the first case studies of these children that he had found that all had this very, very similar condition. And Donald T was case number one. So Donald was extraordinarily lucky because Mary and Beeman Triplett chose to take their, both their wealth and their stature in the community to figure out what was wrong with their child. At first, she did what everybody else was told to do. She sent him into an institution, and they did that, the triplets did that for about a year. He was at this place called the Preventorium, but he got worse. And Donald became more and more withdrawn there and more detached. And Mary decided, this is not what I'm gonna do with my son. And then she did everything she could to make him part of the world. The other thing that was really, really fortunate for Donald, which is there was this community called Forest, Mississippi, which is, you know, like no place I've ever been in the world. And they just decided, they didn't even know that Donald had autism. Try on some pants. Oh, yes. Okay. Burns Clothing Store and try on pants. That's right. 
the community completely embraced him and protected him and watched out for him. You like that one pretty good? Yeah. And what about a new shirt to go with these pants? Uh, uh, no, this is fine. I think that had a huge impact on who Donald is today. Hey, Shelby Welby. Hey, Donald. Hey, Nat the Cat. Hey, RC. Hey, John. Hey, KH. Hey, John. He comes to the bank every day at 2 o'clock, you know, makes his rounds. Hey, Big Debbie. Hey, Tricky Nick. He was a teller in his early years, and then he worked in bookkeeping. He would stuff statements. He really hey, brightens our day darling. at the bank. Hey, Jan, with a plan. Hey, Don, darling. As a young boy, he started to number people. So that's his, that's his way of saying, I like you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he gave me a number 61 or 62 years ago, 569. 13, 15, 1315. I can call Don right now and say, Don, what's my number? That's John Rushing. Uh, he's one of the people I gave numbers to, his numbers. 192. When Donald gave me my number, I knew I was in. And that was a great feeling. Thank you. I'm 549 and John is 550. Oh. And I always say that's because I'm younger. Tell him about the episode where our mother suggested it to you that you drink eight glasses of water a day. Uh, uh, you remember that? Uh, yes, I remember that. And uh, but what think, did you do? Uh, I don't know if it was eight or six, but anyway, well, whatever. Uh, I got six glasses and lined them up and filled them with water, and I drank one by one, each one of them. And mother came in there and said, Don, what are you doing? And Don's res response to her was, well, you told me to drink six glasses of water. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh -huh, right. So that's a little bit of a glimpse of who Donald is today. I think the, the real message is that that community has embraced him enormously. But that was something we didn't see at first. At first, well, we did see it, but we got a very peculiar angle on it. You know, when we, after I, we knew that we had found him, um, we made some calls and uh, reached out to some people in Forest. And the very first thing we were told was, because we didn't want to just go knock on his door, because he had, had been private his whole life. We didn't know, we actually didn't even know that he didn't, they didn't know that he did, ha, had autism. And um, so we, in reaching out to, the, to some people in the community, um, we were told, well, well, we'll introduce you to Donald. But if you mess with him in any way, we will track you down and we will get you. <laughs> and, and they were not kidding. They were so protect, protective of Donald that they, the whole community had that kind of response towards him. And we gave our word, and if you know, Donald didn't want to be connected to us in any way, that would be OK. And we're actually now been friends with them, the triplets, for years. Yeah, but we, we really did make the commitment that if they said go away, we would go away. Um, and I think, I think that, that the strength of that commitment came through and actually built trust with, with the family. And, uh, and, and they are friends of ours now. Um, and, and what we began to try to figure out was to, through interviews with all of those people, fill in the story between the time that the medical literature ended and, and, and the present day of Donald. Like, what happened in that community? And so we, we discovered a few things, and, and one of them, and, and those things in the book spin off into other issues, and they will in the film as well. And one of them is that it was enormously important to the kind of acceptance he had in the community, we believe that his parents had social power and clout, that when they brought their son back into their home and said, he stays here, and the mother who had pull went down to the local public school, which had no legal obligation in those days to ed offer education to a disabled child. In those child. days, you couldn't go to school if you had autism. The school system could say, we're not taking you. you were institutionalized, mothers were blamed for their children's autism. I mean, Donald grew up in a bubble almost. Yes. He had an extraordinary life. It was not the life of, of, of that time in history at all. So his, mother, his mom talked, went to the school principal and said, he's gonna go to school here, and the school principal said, yes, he will. And he ended up going to school, and he ended up going to graduating late. And there were, 
he, he, and, and over time, he acclimated to being around other people. He began to pick up language from them. And this exposure was incredibly important to him. I mean, there was also, there's also, the, and through, interestingly, the history of autism has a lot to do with Nazis in ways that I can't get into right now. But you may recently have heard that Hans Asperger, who uh, coined the, the phrase Asperger's syndrome, is something we write about in the book, was complicit with the Nazi murder of disabled children. But there's more than that. Uh, and then there's a race story in relation to autism as well. I mean, Donald's, Donald was white in a small southern town with rich parents who could get him help. They were unquestionably going to be children of color in that same community who, who would not get that help then. And even today, that there's a lag in, in that issue. Diagnosis so, is much later for all people of color. And, and that, that hasn't changed at all, really. So, so those things kind of bounce off of Donald's story. But to get back to what Donald's story, like what did go right for him? What are the indications? It was this community acceptance flipped on its head the notion that there was something wrong with him in that town. And the story circulated that he was actually rather gifted. And that became the story about Donald that people embraced. He was different, but he was gifted. And you know, you, were, you already saw in the film his, his interest in numbers and how he gave numbers to people. But his interest in numbers went beyond that. He loved to do calculations. He, he can do instant calculations of three digits times three digit numbers, or two digits times two digits. He can, he'll, you give him, you know, what's 24 times 96, and he looks up for a second, and then he. He's, and you can still do that at 85 years old. And he has a skill that's very common among uh, people with autism called calendar calculation, where you say, I was born on uh, July 11th, uh, 2001. He'll tell you what day of the week that was instantly. That's a very kind of common thing. Um, but um, everywhere we went when we began interviewing these peers of Donald's, who are also now in their 80s, uh, about what he was like in high school in the 1950s. And he'd walk around, he'd memorize all the license plates in town and just kind of spill out the numbers. Yeah. Um, so, so this concept came up that he was gifted as opposed to challenged. And by the way, he is challenged. Uh, it's not so evident in the film, but he really, really can't carry on a conversation with his brother sitting in the, in the rocking chairs there. His brother was prompting him through every step of telling that story. It was very unusual for Donald to tell a whole story that way. Um, and, and he has routines that was also typical of autism. He, he, he lives on his own, but he's got set routines. He watches Wheel of Fortune at the same time every day. And uh, again, the numbers, uh, the things that are spinning are still attractive to him. But the really, the really big thing that made his life different is he had a job. And most people with autism don't get to have a job. I mean, over 80%. Uh, are unemployed. And that, again, and, was because his parents gave him a job at the bank that they Right. Owned. So, And not only did they give him a job at the bank, excuse me, they let him fail. So he had different jobs at the bank. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Do you want when me he, to interrupt and step in and no, while you cough? No. no. <laughs> okay. okay. <coughs> um, when, he, um, when, he, when he wasn't successful in one job, since his parents owned the bank, he could try out another one. I mean, one of his very first jobs was as a teller. And when people walked in, he would greet them and say, hi, number 53694. That was their account number. You have $432 left in your account. <laughs> and that was a very short-lived job. <laughs> but, but there were others. And, um, but the fact that he could have a job the fact that he could fail at a job and then l learn where he was best, where he fit in, is where, what we're still working on today. I mean, what Donald had in Forest, Mississippi, and he still has to this day, is a community that really embraced him. And, and we believe that that made a huge impact on his life. And, and there's a story that captures what was happening in Forest <laughs> that we just love sharing. Uh, about something that happened in 1952 that kind of sealed the story that Donald was this mathematical genius. The brick story. The brick story. The brick story. Everybody, in, everybody we interviewed. Did said, you hear the brick story? You know about the bricks in the school building, don't you? And so we said, well, what's the story? And they said, well, one day in 1951 or 52, and the details are a little fuzzy, Donald was at the high school. He graduated from high school at the age of 21. He was late in everything, but he always got there because he was given the chance. And um, 
He stepped out of the high school, which is now destroyed, but we looked up some old photographs of it, and it was this mammoth red brick building, thousands of bricks on the side of the building with no windows, just a doorway. And the story goes that he stepped out on the front steps and he was surrounded by a group of boys, and it's unclear whether they were fans of his or teasing him or whatever, but they said to him, hey, Donald, if you're so good with numbers, why don't you tell us how many bricks are in the school building there? And the story goes that Donald looked over his shoulder for a second, and then he looks back at the boys and he tosses out the number and their jaws drop. And they ran off and told their friends and their friends told their friends. And you know, 60 years later, we're still hearing the story from everyone around town. You know that Donald counted the bricks in the school building. And this is one of the things that really sealed this idea. And everybody loves this story about him. So I asked him. We, we had been hanging, visiting, coming down to report on the story for a number of years, and one day I, I just sort of said to him, so, so how did you do it? How did you figure out how many bricks there were? And he looked at me and he said, I didn't. I made it up. <laughs> And so then, so then I asked him, well, well, why did you do that? And he said, I, I wanted the boys to like me. And it sort of tells you everything about someone with autism. Um, when you think that, that they don't, people say people with autism don't have love, want to be alone, all of these myths of autism that aren't true. Um, Donald just sort of spelt out right at that moment. So, we, we don't want to, again, portray uh, Forest, Mississippi as Mayberry RFD. Uh, mm -hmm. Some good things happened there, but I mean, it was a town that had segregated water fountains at all the time that Donald was growing up. And again, there is the issue that his parents had this political pull in town. And there's also a very important issue that nobody with autism is typical. Uh, it's not the case that everybody's life is going to turn out the way that Donald's would have. has had a lot to do with his own potential. But we do think that what Forrest shows is that when the right things are in place, that people who are on the spectrum can really, really get the chance to reach, to reach their potential. And as Karen alluded to, I mean, the, meanwhile, this diagnosis is crystallized around Donald, put in, pushed into the public literature in, in 1943, begins to get real attention and traction in the 1950s, and then more so in the 1960s. Nothing like today. I mean, again, uh, it, I, I mentioned this morning during the aperitifs that 25 years ago, most people still were kind of very vague about what this idea of autism was, but still it was getting traction in the psychiatric profession. And as Karen said, there was this awful time when autism was blamed on mothers. Uh, it's something we write about extensively, but if parents, if a, parents took their children to a psychiatrist, which is what they did, if they knew about that, and if they knew about psychiatry, if they had the money and the inclination to approach that profession, they would say, what's wrong with my child? And the, the mother would be told, you failed to love your child enough at birth, and this is your fault. So imagine, Refrigerator. right? Your Refrigerator mother yeah, it was called. Yeah. Imagine you're, you're, you have a child with autism, and on top of that, you're blamed. And in some ways, well, maybe I could fix it. So that's what mothers tried to do. They tried to fix it. And we lost 20 years of research. Well, by fix it, you mean they tried to fix themselves. Because that's what the right. psychiatrist would say. What do I do for my child? You, mom, have to go into intensive psychotherapy to figure out what you did wrong and change yourself. And, and many men, w women did it. Karen interviewed one mom who now lives in, in Florida who, who cried through this interview because she'd never talked about it before. And. She was so excited when one day in therapy, she realized that she knew exactly the moment that she had done it. Because when he was first born, he, he looked like a chicken and he was yellow because he had jaundice. And she said, that's it. I thought my baby looked like a chicken. That's how I called it, caused his autism. And it was a relief for her, which just says how, how sad the times were for families. But on the whole, that, that theory was demolished by parents. One parent in particular who was a psychologist has passed away now at 12 years. He spent years as a campaigner and a crusader 
for the rights of autistic kids to go to school and to close down institutions. But he put together a study in the 19, late 1960s that completely demolished this theory. So it was a parent who overdid that. And it was parents who fought to close the institutions that children were being sent to. And it was parents, very importantly, who forced to open the schools of the public school system, which were shut until 1975 to children with uh, autism and other disabilities. School systems had the legal right to say and usually exercised it that your kid is not the taxpayer's problem, the school system's problem, goodbye. And, p and parents were pushed away routinely and parents were the ones who changed that. So there's, a, there's, a court, there's an arc to the story that gets better and better. That doesn't mean that we're there yet in so many ways. Um, there, you know, individuals on the spectrum which is now much more broadly defined than it used to be, are, are routinely bullied. As Karen mentioned, they had a very difficult time getting work. If somebody on the spectrum does mess up as a job, they're out the door, rather than in that bank in Forest, Mississippi, given a second chance. So those are, those are kind of uh, the, the, the challenges that remain today. Our conviction is that most people want to do the right thing if they know the story, they just don't know the story, so that's why we're telling the story and why we're making the film and why we want to reach the civilians. Um, and there's a story that we tell near the end of the book that to us kind of captures the, the thing that we're aiming for. Uh, and we describe a scene that took place uh, in 2006 on a bus in New Jersey. Uh, it was a regular city bus that back and forth the same route every day. And back and forth on that same route, um, there was a young man riding on the bus whose name was Nicholas. He was a teenager, late teenager. He didn't look like a cute little child anymore. He was an adult with autism. And when adults with autism aren't cute and cuddly the way kids with autism can, I mean, that's important in terms of how the public reacts to them. So Nicholas was riding back and forth on this bus because he was being taught how to ride the bus, how to use public transportation. He needed that education because, number one, he couldn't speak. He, 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 he was nonverbal. Uh, and, and something, a system as complicated as that that he wasn't exposed to before was very, very challenging to him. So over weeks, he and a teacher had been going through the steps of how to use the public transportation system, you know, how to get to the bus stop, how to hail the bus, which one is yours, how to get on, how to pay, how to find your seat, how to sit down, how to stop the bus when your stop comes, how to get off. And, you know, this was investment in time was so worth it because if this young man could get out of his front door and get on the bus and go somewhere, how liberating is that? How much more power does that give him in his life? So it's a huge thing. So it was going well, back and forth the same day. By the way, you know, when a bus goes back and forth the same pass route the same time every day, some, the same passengers tend to be making that trip the same time every day. Everybody has their patterns. So a lot of people were kind of watching this going on. So they got to the point on this one day when Nicholas was alone sitting in the front seat. The teacher had faded to sitting in the back of the bus just to keep his eye on things. And the bus comes to a stop, and two guys get on the bus, and they sit down in the seat behind Nicholas, who again is sitting alone. And the bus starts moving. And at this point, Nicholas begins to rock back and forth in his seat, and he begins doing this with his fingers. It's called stimming. It's very typical uh, autistic behavior. And then he begins to vocalize. And I say vocalize because he didn't have language. He began to make sounds, and he began to make loud sounds. And what happens is that the two guys behind him start to harass him. And they lean into him, and they start, you know, hey, Stop doing that noise. What's wrong with you? What's your problem anyway? And all of a sudden, this other passenger jumps up and he says, to the, he looks at these two guys and he says, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? He's got autism. Why don't you back off? And at that moment, the bus had become a community watching out for Nicholas. And you could see that it wasn't so hard for someone to have the back of somebody who was different. They just needed to see and know and understand. And to us, that's the message. If we can get people to, to see and know and understand people who are different, they'll, they'll have their backs. And, and, and that's what we think Donald's story ultimately tells us, is it shows us the ways that when the right things are in place, it can work. And a guy, the, the boy whose behaviors gave us the classic diagnosis of autism has turned out to be in a community that loves and embraces him, we think is a very, very powerful and important story. And that a little bit of forest happened on that bus. And our message is that a little bit of forest can go everywhere if the civilians are just kind of given the information and the inspiration. Because 
again, we basically think most people want to do the right thing. So we're happy to take any questions, or we could keep yakking. <laughs> Right. Oh, and a microphone will be brought to you, and we wanted to ask, do, would you like folks to stand up? Do you need, no? Okay. And we just need you to wait for the microphone. You know, the thing also about Donald is, Donald is, is as John said, it, basically there's a saying that goes, if you met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. But, but Donald, you know, autism can be very, very, very severe, like the, the, the young man on the bus. Um, and that he, that, that Donald had the capacity to go to school and had the capacity to have a job is not always the case with somebody with autism. Uh, so my question is, are you familiar with a program called the Threshold Program at Lesley University? Mm -hmm. It is a two-year certificate program that caters to young adults who are on the spectrum or who have neurological disorders. And the whole purpose of the program is to teach them independent living skills and build a community of support where they work with a number of local employers and they help these children sort of learn basic skills like financial planning. Same thing. They start them out with how do you manage the T system and take them through the buses and right. you know that type of thing. Um, and they provide internships, free internships, so that by the end of the two years, something like 84% of the students who graduate from the program end up with some type of a job. Wow. Usually in the local area, uh -huh. they built a, an alumni support community because a lot of those kids end up staying in the area. Well, can I let My, my son's yeah. in a program that's very yeah. similar. He's in Phoenix, and I live in New Jersey, and he's there because. But we need more programs yeah. like that, because what yeah. they do is they help them develop that confidence, the right. independent living, and, right. and they form a community of support for the, for the young people who graduate from right. that yeah. program. Another thing is about what you're saying is there are those programs now, and, and even 25 years ago, that, those things would have well, been Well, and they're still very few and far yeah. between. Yeah. Another question? Hi. Um, um, oh, and the mic is coming to you. Uh, for, first of all, I want to say that the book is really incredible. <laughs> it's a riveting read, and uh, thankfully, um, Ben Rosen encouraged me to start it. And uh, Thanks, it's <laughs> kind of like, um, it kind of is at the crossroads of um, Siddhartha Mukherjee's um, book on cancer and his biography of cancer and Randy Schultz and the band played on mm -hmm. because the stories you tell. So it's very, very interesting. I wondered if you could speak to the advent of research behind autism and, and how that developed and. I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do the sort of 30 second version of it. Um, there used to be no research because psychiatry knew what caused autism and that was mothers. So for 35 years, there was no research done. Because uh, why bother? We know what causes it. And that began to pivot in the 1970s when... Uh, it was parents so, again. Yeah, parents, parents pushed... Uh, there were two, two avenues. One was uh, psychological behavioral therapy, which developed primarily out of UCLA by uh, a, a doctor who was very controversial because some of the methods that he used were considered very harsh, and they were. Uh, but those softened over time, but his, his uh, base of support came from parents. And then in the 1990s, uh, two families on opposite sides of the U.S. began from scratch to raise money uh, to, to encourage scientists to study autism. And it was really, I think this story is worth telling. One of those guys, he was like a, a parent of, a, of, adult, of a son, now an adult, he himself was a psychiatrist. He went to the uh, annual Society of Neuroscience uh, in 1992. It was held in Washington, and he wanted to see who there was doing work on autism. He got a hold of the abstracts presented there. There are 14,000 of them. This was the Society of Neuroscience brain stuff. Who was focusing on autism? Nobody out of the 14,000. And eleven. So, there were eleven. No, there were eleven references, references to autism. References to the word But they were autism. they were they were this but this, not even this instance studies. like autism, but nobody was focused on autism. Today, it, it it's almost a way to get funding to put the word autism, throw the word autism in, because so those those parents flipped that because they they did two things. They went out and raised a lot of money, and then they drove around to universities and they asked, "Can we please meet with the young grad students?" 
who are up and coming, and they convinced several of them to make autism the focus of their careers, which nobody wanted to do at that time because it was seen as a complete dead end. But the money talked, and these people went into it, and some of those scientists today are extremely prominent in their fields because they took, they took that gamble. So that was really the turning point. I'm looking at biomedical and genetic research. Sorry, that was longer than 30 seconds. But. <laughs> Mike is coming in. So I, I well, listened to the book on tape, riveting, as Bernadette said. It's just an excellent, beautifully written, expressive. And what you come away with is, at least for me, is that the things you've talked about around Robert in this sanctuary that he lives in. Most, oh, Donald. Donald, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Donald. Mm -hmm. Most of the kids growing up in America don't have those sanctuaries. Right. And I remember seeing a video, uh, just a devastating video, of a young man with autism who gets attacked by the police yeah. and brutally mistreated. So hopefully, in, through this, these videos, these books are being given to the police departments and education is... Yeah working in those areas. And uh, just one other question. Can you just be, could you specifically define the spectrum? Because now I hear people say, he's on the spectrum. She's on the spectrum. Is everybody on the spectrum? Well, that's, that, that, <laughs> the that, much we, easier question we, is the police question. We, we, <laughs> we see that as a, as a huge problem. Um, that we now, we used to have Asperger's, and that was taken out of the DSM. And that was, that was sort of the line in the sand from people who were capable of being more independent um, and people with classic autism. And so now the, the diagnosis, every, everybody fits the package. So the person who's literally you know, hitting their head against a wall or um, will be in diapers their whole life, have no language, is called the same thing than someone who has their PhD. Um, and you know, we see that as a problem. Um, we also think that maybe there are just many, many, many different autisms. It's not just one thing. Um, but it, we, we find that in society right now. And we're, and we're going to try to address that in the film in a big way, that, that debate and what should be done about it. Because it's also divisive. It's divisive because there are people on the spectrum who, as is today defined, who are very proud of their identity as being autistic. And then there are people on the spectrum whose parents want nothing more than for their, their child's autism to be cured. And so the people at the higher end of the spectrum are saying, You're, you want to negate, you want to cure away who I am. And the people, the parents at the other end are going, no, I just want to give my kid a shot in life. And there's, there are annual, four times a year, there are meetings of a panel of uh, experts and parents and people on the spectrum that they held at the NIH. And it's turned into an ar arguments between these two sides about what the priorities should be. So it's a, you've put your finger on a very, very complicated problem, and it's divisive. As for the police thing, um, a lot of people on the autism spectrum, by the way, people on the spectrum used to be locked away in institutions, and everybody said that was a bad thing, which it totally was. And then, but let's stop having institutionalization. Let's let people out into the world. That's happened, but the world isn't quite ready for them. And so. The, these conflicts happen with the police. So the police will see somebody doing something that's suspicious, will stop that person and challenge them. That person may have, as, because of autism, have a reaction that, that, that is violent or aggressive seeming or run or not understand. That triggers or just in the, not listen. That, and that triggers in the yeah. cop, there's some, this guy's up to something, and it turns into a bad incident. And the scene you saw, there was a boy in Alaska who liked yeah, to, so. to test people's cars. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, he, and some visitors came to town and they saw him getting in the, everybody in the street knew if, he's in, if this guy's in your car, he's, he likes to be in your car. But some pe newcomers, I think they were staying in a motel, something like that. They saw somebody in their car, they called the police, the police came, the police said to the guy, what are you doing? He said, I wanna go home. No, what are you doing? I wanna go home. You're not answering our question. I wanna go home. You're not answering our, they throw him on the ground, answer our question, answer our question. And then he's he starts struggling. rolling, and they say, we're going to pepper spray you. And he starts rolling, I want to go home. So they sprayed him in the eyes. So that, that police department, they got sued for it. And there have been other incidents like that. Our feeling about that is the cops just don't know. 
they don't know. There is training out there. And, and that's the other thing, yeah. is that it, it, there is training going on. But the, it's the, not the police big departments enough, hate enough. when this happens because they look terrible, and it was yeah. completely accidental. Sorry. Hi. Um, so to answer, um, there's ASD1, ASD2, and ASD3, and that is how much support the person needs. So a lot of what you're referring to is people that have what would be now called ASD 2 or 3. And the people who have ASD 1 may be somebody like Andy Warhol, Jerry Seinfeld. So I think the kind of characterization of autism, and I think this is where that you were talking about sort of the split, is that there are some people that are very high functioning and can do very well with these characteristics and have the help around them because they're so high functioning. And it's the lower functioning uh, kids that go ahead and need to have the support and can have wonderful and happy lives eventually, but they do need the support all the way around as much as the high functioning ones. So, more so. More so. You know, more say, yeah. so. Yeah, much more so. so. Um, and the other thing is, is the one thing that I would suggest for everybody is that you take your child into the police department and you go ahead and introduce your child and you go ahead and explain to the police department wherever you live, my child has autism. Give them a photograph of your child and um, explain your child's disability to them. It's up to you to go ahead and train the people around you, your teachers, you have to advocate. Right. Advocation is so important. Yep. And it's easier in a small town like Forest and a lot of small towns. Right. But let's and take this book another. is about yeah. advocating and, and teaching. It's wonderful. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Right in the. Thank you very much. Um, is autism more prevalent today? Because some people feel it may be, I don't know. Or is it just that it's being recognized and diagnosed as it should be? Guess what we don't agree on completely is, the, is this one. Well, uh, we know for sure that we count better and that we're identifying people with autism more often and that the spectrum has gotten larger. So we've broadened out the definition. Um, the, where we disagree is, is that, well, I'll just say that I, there, there's some still unaccounted for. So um, there, I believe that there's a, a certain amount of an increase. But generally speaking, a lot of it is the, the basic diagnosis and the, the, how we keep changing the definition and broadening it. A, a lot of it depends to, you know, the, the reason that autism is perceived as now underdiagnosed in communities of color is because there aren't people in communities of color providing services to diagnose. Also, there's a kind of bias if there's, there's society is gonna give a different diagnosis still to a disruptive black boy versus a disrupt, disruptive white boy. So th that's just one example of the, the many, many ways that the diagnosis is actually relatively, I don't wanna say arbitrary, but subjective. Um, and the subjectivity is beginning to come under control to the point where, first of all, there's a, there's a, there's a whole kind of di autism diagnostic in, uh, uh, complex now that's out there looking to find cases to help kids who need support. That, that pulls the numbers up. My, my wife is a physician, and I were talking about this. She said when, when a gonorrhea clinic opens in a community, rates of gonorrhea in that community skyrocket from the previous year because they weren't being diagnosed. So that's a very, very telling example of how, uh, how just the process of diagnosis can make, give the impression that there's higher numbers. And people are talking about it more. Again, 25 years ago, you, you wouldn't have said, maybe that kid's on the spectrum and you should get him. You wouldn't have known about that. So I tend to think that almost all of, maybe all of the perceived increase is an, is an artifact of looking for it, expanding the definition, and recognizing it. And Karen is right that, that there have been analyses that have said, well, that accounts for a lot of it, but not all of it. But I tend, in my gut, to think it's going to be a lot of it. One other question. Sure. I had heard a while back, and I, I would like you to um, say, could there be any truth to this, or it's a fallacy? 
um, that it was in some cases linked to older fathers, the sperm being older. Um, is there any truth to that? There's yeah. been some research that, that says that that's, that's possible. And we're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.